All right, this is OpenStax U.S. History, Chapter 2, Section 2, Religious Upheavals in the Developing Atlantic World. Uh, one thing that motivated the colonization of the New World was profit, and we saw that in the case of the Spanish conquest in the previous section. But another big motivation is the religious factor. So we're going to look more specifically at religion. Uh, and the role that religion plays in the Atlantic world and ultimately the Americas. Now we're gonna focus on Europe first here, uh, specifically Western Europe, the religion of the Portuguese, the religion of the Spanish, uh, and ultimately the religion of some of these other European colonizers such as the Dutch, the English, and the French. So dating back to the Middle Ages, essentially in Western Europe, those are the nations and people who make their way to the New World, there was one church in town, and that was the Western Roman Catholic Church. And at the head of the Western Roman Catholic Church was the Pope, right, who was the leader. We're just going to call it the Catholic Church for short here. And no matter where you were in Europe, uh, you know, especially during the Middle Ages, but also afterwards, um, no matter what country you lived in, what language that you spoke, who was your king or queen, those things all varied throughout Europe. But if you were religious, you were a member of the Catholic Church, you recognized the Pope as the authority of the Church. And that was more or less universal. Catholicism was a unifying factor in Western Europe uh, in the 1500s. That was until Martin Luther. Martin Luther is this person that you see pictured here. Um, because the Catholic Church had been the essentially the only game in town for a thousand years, they had become in some respects corrupt. And there were individuals who were not satisfied with the way that things were going with the Catholic Church. Uh, primarily among them was Martin Luther. And so Luther protested, right, protests the church. This is happening in the early 1500s, right? We're going to say 1510s through 1520s is when Luther is making his protests. Some of the things that he protests from the church includes the sell of indulgences. An indulgence essentially is a, we can call it just a ticket to heaven. Right? The idea is that you purchase this from the church and then the church kind of gives you the, the green light to say in the afterlife, you'll have a free passage to heaven. Luther didn't agree with that. He believed more in uh, morality, dictating what happens to one in the afterlife. Uh, you had taxation, which shouldn't need any sort of explanation. You had the fact that mass, mass essentially is kind of like prayer, was done in Latin, which was a language. And that all the church ceremonies and all the Bibles and everything was done in the official language of Latin. Problem? Most people don't speak Latin. In fact, Martin Luther and others, he was German. So Martin Luther wanted to make sure that prayers and mass and the Bible even, that those were all done in the vernacular language, the language that people actually spoke and understood, rather than being officially in Latin. These were just some of the things that Luther didn't like right about the catholic church he posted his 95 theses which was a list of 90 95 things the catholic church needs to change and this event is known as the reformation think about reformation reform that initially when martin luther started his protests he wanted the catholic church to change he wanted to reform the church to make it more in line with his specific beliefs and the beliefs of a lot of other people in Europe at that particular time. You had other reformers come along. John Calvin, he's another reformer. He sort of puts forward this idea of Calvinism, which is a, you know, an offshoot of Christianity that, of course, uh, you know, has sort of different connotations to it. John Calvin's major contribution is the idea of predestination. That is the idea that it is predetermined, right, whether or not you go to heaven or hell, that that is predetermined before you're born, uh, and that 
uh, really kind of the, the game then is, so to speak, is to figure out who's predestined for heaven and who is predestined for hell. Both of these, Luther, uh, his, or his followers were called Lutherans. Not sure about the spelling there. Um, but Lutherans, Calvinists, uh, they essentially fit into this category that rejected the authority of the Pope. And we'll use a different uh, color here to indicate what we call this event. Actually, let's not use blue, let's use red. But this official breakaway from the church, because even though it started off as a reform movement, Luther and his followers, followers Calvin and his followers, eventually break free from the Catholic Church and choose to do things their own way. This event is called the Protestant Reformation. Right, the Protestant Reformation. Let's make sure that we can see that. And officially what it does is that it ends up splitting Christianity into two groups. We have our Catholics on this side. Right? Those are the same Catholics who recognize the authority of the Pope, belong to the Western Catholic Church. They you know, believe in having the official language being Latin. And another group we simply just call Protestants. All right, Protestants. Now, Protestants and Catholics are both Christian, right? But Catholics essentially believe in the Pope. Protestants don't. And that's kind of the key way of differentiating the two. Under the group of Protestants, we could put Lutheran and his, and his followers, Calvinists, those who believe in predestination, and many, many, many more that we will, uh, that we will eventually talk about. So the Protestant Reformation is very important because when we talk about Christianity and especially colonizing the New World, uh, there's a difference between those that are Catholics and those that are Protestants. And in fact, they, in fact, they have different goals. Uh, we talked about this previously when it comes to Catholic nations. We want to fill in Spain, right? Spain, we know as being a predominantly Catholic nation, having talked a little bit about Spanish interaction in the New World. Now, you had a different different event, um, similar, very, very similar, but different event occurring in England, sometimes referred to as the English Reformation. Uh, in this case, we had the King of England, Henry VIII, King, and he wanted a male heir to the throne, right? He wanted a son who would then assume the crown to be King of England. Uh, when his wife would not produce or could not produce a male heir, uh, King Henry VIII uh, petitioned the Pope asking for an annulment, which is essentially a divorce. Being a member of the Roman Catholic Church, the Pope had the authority, had the power to grant an annulment. The idea for Henry VIII was to divorce his wife, marry another woman, so that she would have a male heir to the throne. However, uh, the Pope refused. And so King Henry VIII instead broke away from the Catholic Church, right? Broke away. And the English Reformation resulted in the creation of the Church of England, sometimes called the Anglican Church. And instead of the Pope being at the head of it, instead we had the king. So the king became the head of the church. And now, having broken away from the Pope, being the head of his own church, Henry VIII can marry and divorce whoever he likes. I think at the end of the day, I think he ended up having something like seven, six or seven wives. He killed two of his wives. He beheaded two of them. Um, but this event, King Henry VIII wanting a divorce, breaking away from the Catholic Church, is known as the English Reformation. And then so in England, you had those who would then belong to the Protestant group, right? The Anglican Church or the Church of England are considered Protestants. They don't recognize the authority of the Pope. But then you also had a group of English people who remained loyal. And so what happened was that in England, you had a lot of religious struggle, much like you had in everywhere else, pretty much around Europe as a result of these events. So we have the new creation of the Church of England here, a Protestant church. Uh, one of Henry's heirs 
Mary, otherwise known as Bloody Mary, attempted to restore Catholicism, right? And this led to bloodshed. She's called Bloody Mary because she persecuted Protestants, right? She wanted to bring uh, England back to the Pope, back to uh, Roman Catholicism. Uh, eventually, Mary gave way to Elizabeth, who became the next Queen of England. This is Elizabeth here. Uh, Elizabeth was fiercely Protestant, right? And more or less, even though there were some growing pains, eventually England becomes a predominantly Protestant nation. So in terms of trying to identify which countries hold what beliefs, if we have our division here, our Catholics and our Protestants, we're going to put England in the Protestant category. There are some Catholic uh, English Catholics, for sure, uh, but we're predominantly going to put England in the Protestant category. We'll talk a little bit more about what some of those belief systems are. One of these Protestant groups were called the Puritans, and a good way to think about the Puritans or to remember the Puritans is what their goal is, and their goal is to purify the Church of England from its Catholic elements, right? So if, you know, if this is the Roman Catholic Church and the Pope, and this is the Church of England, right, where Elizabeth and most English sit, the Puritans want to go one step further. They say, okay, great, we've moved away from the Catholic Church, which is good, but we need to move away even more. So for example, the head of the Catholic Church is the Pope. The head of the Church of England is the King. A Puritan would say, that's pretty much the same thing, right? We need to get rid of more of these Catholic elements. Now, these Puritans were not as popular as some of these other uh, Protestant groups, and so they did face persecution. In fact, one of the motivating factors for some of the very first English settlers to settle in New England, which consists of what is modern-day Massachusetts, uh, is in fact this religious persecution, right? So when we think about, well, why do some of these English colonists come to the New World? What brings uh, you know, 3,000, I think 6,000 English settlers in the early 1600s, well, we can tie it back to religion, right, and the role that religion has to play. Now, the Protestant Reformation itself was incredibly deadly, more or less from the 1500s to 1650-ish, we'll say. There was religious war, and there was religious war everywhere. It was Catholics versus the Protestants. And warfare broke out essentially all over Europe, a very, very violent uh, time period. In the case of Spanish power, now recall, Spain is over here with the Catholic side, right? So any country that seeks to challenge Spanish power or even challenge the Catholic Church, Spain is really responsible for, um, for enforcing that. And so while Spain is busy conquering the New World and becoming incredibly wealthy, they have religious problems back at home, and that is to really carry out the wishes of the Pope and the Catholic Church and put down this rebellion, right, to put Protestants essentially out of their misery. And uh, this conflict takes a number of different forms. One of them is in the form of Dutch independence. So you have the creation of a country here in the Netherlands, which declares its independence from Spain and does so as a Protestant nation. All right, so we want to consider the Dutch or the Netherlands to be Protestant because England broke away Spain sent the Spanish Armada, which is a huge naval fleet, to attack the English, right, in 1588. However, the English won. So this more or less ensures that England remains a Protestant nation, right? England, of course, with all the events regarding Henry, 
to Bloody Mary, then finally to Elizabeth, who upheld Protestantism. The Spanish said that that was unacceptable, sent a huge naval fleet to defeat them. The English ended up defeating that fleet and remained a Protestant nation. This time period is characterized by religious intolerance. This conflict between Protestants and Catholics more or less is one in which neither side is willing to tolerate each other's belief systems. That if you're a Catholic, you are more than okay with killing a Protestant based only on their belief system and vice versa. One of the most uh, egregious examples of this is the St. Bartholomew Day's massacre, which occurred in France. And the effect that the um, Protestant Reformation had on France was to send France into a civil war. So you had French Catholics and French Protestants, again, bo both sides being French, French speaking, uh, fight each other and kill each other. The St. Bartholomew Day's Massacre right here in this image, a group of French Protestants were invited into, uh, I don't know what it was, like a square or something like that, a, a, a town. Uh, under the idea they were going to sign a peace treaty, all the doors were locked and the Protestants were massacred. And so one of the consequences that all of this religious conflict creates is what we might call a refugee crisis. And guess where many of these refugees are gonna seek asylum? That's right, the New World. So in order to understand why some people come to the New World, we'll go all the way back up to the top here. Uh, it's important to understand the underlying religious changes, the most important one of them being, of course, the Protestant Reformation and the effect that that has on Europe and ultimately has on the New World.